wow, the things you can learn when you get a pet project in your head and you're like, I really want to try this. I changed my mind. I don't really want to try this anymore. Well, actually, I do really want to try it, but I don't think I will. Um, so, when, when I start to look at a project, I say to myself, hey, you know, research it. And you do. You, you say, okay, you know what, I, I want to do power over Ethernet. Okay, I researched it. You know, the research was relatively simple. Um, everywhere said, yeah, go ahead, do it, whatever you want to do. I was like, okay, sweet. Then um, there were certain rules and limitations that I found you could stretch very far, and so I did. I stretched them very far, and I, I've even like cranked 95 watts of power through an Ethernet cable, and I haven't burnt it, so I considered, hey, you know, that's pretty simple. Now, then I decided, oh, what happens if I want to extend my Wi-Fi signal far enough that I can reach it anywhere in the city of Corning, or at my workplace, or anywhere in the surrounding areas? And I looked it up, and I was like, oh, this shouldn't be that hard. You know, it didn't seem that hard. You know, get an antenna, and um, you should be good to go. So I am I was looking at it, and I'm looking at the price of the antenna, and I'm like, okay, I need to double-check this, because this antenna is like 150 bucks, so I need to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. Well, I started to learn about stuff I didn't expect. I really, like, in-depth searched it, and... I, I, I came across this really cool thing called the Freshnel Zone. It's called the Freshnel Zone. So when you're looking at two points on the planet Earth, like at least like five to, at least greater than five miles, like they, they say five miles is a good starting point where you need to start looking at Freshnel Zone. And what, they're, what they basically start saying is, because there's two points that are on opposite sides of the curvature of the Earth, it displaces you by so many feet because the point in the middle is actually going to be naturally higher than the points on the outside. So then I went back at my data and I said, oh crap, well, the, the point in the middle of the, the zone that I want to send Wi-Fi to is lower then my zone on the end, which is good, which would mean that I could still shoot the signal up towards it, and it would just, it would clip the top of that mountaintop, but then it would continue on, and it would go, and it would hit the point that I want to get to. Because of the Freshnel zone, this point is actually 20 feet lower, and this point's actually 10 feet higher, which makes this freaking point higher than the other point I want to go to. So I was like, oh, great. So what would it take to compensate for that? Well, considering the distance is great is over five miles, the height translation between those two points is almost 200 feet. And so I started thinking, of like, well, what did that mean? And I thought about it, and I was like, never mind, I'm not doing that. I could probably get 100 feet easily. I could attach it to a tree. Um, I know how to do power line networking, so I literally just run an Ethernet cable from my house up to a tree, get 100 feet, no problem. But 200 feet, I was like, I don't think I can do this. That sucks. I mean, it would have been really cool to like send my signal all over the place, but in order to get to uh, any anywhere I'd want to go, I'd have to have a really tall, and I mean a seriously tall, uh, adapter, you know, like, uh, or just movable locations. Um, the, the issue actually is that I'm trying to basically broadcast over one hill to a different hill. And I didn't really realize that at first. I thought that it was a small hill and then there's a big hill in the back. And no, the hills are like closer in size than I thought they were. There's like a 70 foot difference between the height from the one hill and the height from the other hill. And I mean, when you're going down on a slope, you know, that's okay, you know, if you're just at the bottom shooting straight up. But when you think about the curve of the earth and then you think about the fact that there's like the direct line goes through the top of the hill, you're like, oh, that's a problem. And then you realize adding the curve of the earth, it goes even further through it, and you're like, oh, this just blows. But anyway, I learned a lot about Wi-Fi and Freshnel Zones, so I mean, it wasn't a completely wasted adventure. I just 
I did a calculator and um, I, I put in some rough values and it was like, it wasn't like, I, I was going to say, if the clearance I would have would be over 100 feet, I'd be okay. It came up with negative 200 feet, which means in order to get my approved clearance for me to go ahead and do this project, I'd have to have a 300 foot tower. And I'm like, oh, I'm not sure I want a 300 foot tower in my <laughs> attached to the roof of my apartment. I don't think my parents would like that much either. And plus, that's in the legal no fly limit. I think isn't that isn't that in the no fly limit? No, it's um, no, that's feet above sea level. Oh, but there's an airport. There's an airport down the road, so I definitely wouldn't be allowed to do it. Yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, that'd be funny. But um. Anyway, I mean, I took this, thing, and I mean, I shot this over two miles, but I had I had a rough line of sight, you know, and if I had gone line of sight, it's supposed to be rated up to, like, 11 miles, you know, line of sight, but the problem is, is I don't have line of sight, so what I would have to do, then, is to find some way of getting to this hill up on, up by the top of my house, where in no man's land, stick a giant antenna on the top of a tree and then basically put it as omnidirectional where it brings in signals and it shoots out signals uh, in all directions and then that would give me a roughly like 10 mile radius around here that would have my Wi-Fi. But I mean that's a little unnecessary and not going to be cost effective because unless somebody volunteers to have me stick an antenna on the top of their house it's not going to work out very well. Um. So that was that project down in the dumps. Um, it took me a while to figure that all out, too. I did a lot of math. A lot of freaking math for that. Holy crap, this paper, like, this this at the top was my diagram chart of, like, what I would have to do. And then um, there's a paper over here that just looks, like, filled with numbers and, like, random math work I, that I did. I was like, oh, crap. But... It, it, it turned out to be that, like, it, in theoretically, it, it's, it would work, theoretically, and that's the problem, is that I, I, I don't want theoretically, I want somebody saying, yeah, you can do this, no problem, like, because I'm, I'm a big guy of, theoretically, a lot of stuff will work, but I want the actual, oh, this will work. I... I have in the past, you know, hundreds of times started projects in that they said, oh, this will theoretically work, you know, and I'd be like, oh, this is awesome, and I'd do the project, and then when I get to the end, I'm like, okay, this is where theory and real don't work out, you know? And I mean, even when I started to get put Wi-Fi out here, like, back before I lived out here, I, there was no Wi-Fi out here, so I was like, okay, I'm going to need Wi-Fi out here in order to do anything, so I can't live there if I don't have Wi-Fi. And, and when I say Wi-Fi, I, I'm implying that there's wireless signal producing my internet. I'm not just saying, oh, stick a router out here and get myself Wi-Fi with no connection to the internet. No. So I had to, in my parents' house, and I mean, my parents' house, the, the Wi-Fi signal goes through one tree. Not a problem. It really isn't a problem. The problem that I seem to be having is the weather, which blows my mind because... Apparently, the signals, these, the antennas that are built in on these Wi-Fi routers, are are weak. And the in the I have to have an external Wi-Fi uh, adapter for out here so that I can put it outside the house. So I looked it up, and the the issue I'm running into is that the antenna that I have is a weak, like, 1 dBi antenna or something ridiculous. And the antennas on the other thing are regular 3 dBi's, you know. Most of the antennas I have are regular 3 dBi's, but that was from the old age, you know. And that's the only one I have. It's the only one that will reach under the door and it will go outside and does what it needs to do. Because it's only 1 dBi, it only broadcasts at a certain strength. Well, apparently a heavy rain will drop my Wi-Fi signal like 50%, which is ridiculous. And I mean, it's it's not it's not really a problem when you get up in the high dBi antennas because those are designed to go so many miles that a little bit of rain doesn't affect them at all. They're they're they are so used to sending signals that are so weak it's not even funny and they're designed to catch them too, which is good. But when you're dealing with a 1 dBi antenna, Apparently, that drop magnifies as you drop down the antennas. So, like, 
you st it's like a, it's like a uh, an exponential graph you know the difference between this one and this one really isn't going to matter well it's sorry it's an exponential graph it goes it's an ex it's a yeah i think that's an exponential graph it's a, a reverse exponential graph uh it's just the exact opposite it's like it starts out infinitely big and then it gets to infinitely small negative exponents that's what it is it's a negative exponent graph so when you start out the signal loss you get starts out here and then goes and then it just after like 10 dbi it doesn't really matter but since that's like a 1 dbi antenna it blows so i mean i didn't know that before it somebody told me that weather affects the wi-fi and i was like that's stupid but no, it's not that. It's that the antenna is so weak that when something affects the air, it affects the Wi-Fi. So it doesn't mean just the weather. It could be a windy day, and I'd lose Wi-Fi signal. And I and that was like, oh, what? It was mind-blowing to learn that. But I was like, I was baffled. I was like, what is going on? Anyway, so that, that project is going to be out the gate. But I might get a Yagi antenna anyway and point it towards the house. It'll, like, it'll apparently is because it's more than a 10 dbi it'll basically make the weather non-existent which is good but i just need to mount it on the top of the house um so that's it for that project that project got thrown out the window um i'm back to building a server computer for my home this buddy right here is going to be that um i'm not going to make anything fancy it's literally going to be an old-fashioned server it's just going to be file storage and other boring stuff it's just gonna run all the time and that way I can start shutting this one off but still have something to connect to but I can leave this one off and I'll, I'll have this one for the ability to start waking crap up on LAN which would be great because then I can wake anything in the house up just by sending a signal through the Wi-Fi um uh, what else is there um I walk into Walmart all these people are staring at me because I'm in my staple shirt still. I walk into Walmart. I walk over to the bread section. And I buy like four loaves of the French bread they have at Walmart for a dollar. So for roughly half of an hour's pay, I bought four loaves of bread that will last me for the next couple of days. Because I'm trying to be money conscious. And I was like, this is brilliant. You know? And so I was like, okay. So... I get up to the checkout and the lady's just looking at me, looking at me. And of course, I went to the self checkout because I, I wanted to get home real quick so that I could start working on one of my projects for tonight before I have to. Uh, just because I, I like to take a little time to work on a project, watch a movie, and then go to bed. Um, so I mean, I'm, I went home, got wanted to get home relatively quickly. And so the lady that runs the self checkout area is just staring at me. And I and I and I lo I get my four lows. I hit them up I put four bucks in the machine and then a little change for tax and then I walk out and I start to walk out and the lady's just staring at me and I'm holding this bag full of bread that's all it's in there and I just I look at her and I say have a good night and then she just goes yeah you too as she's staring at me while I walk out and I'm like what is so weird and then I thought about it and I was like this does look weird I'm in my staples outfit Walking into Walmart, buying like a a huge like it was it didn't look that it doesn't look that big and it doesn't last that long, but it looks like you're buying a lot of bread. It does because you're buying these loaves that are like this long and you're buying four of them and it just looks weird. I thought about it and I was like, yeah, I guess I would stare because that's pretty freaking weird. I mean, because I was dressed in work clothes and I like ran in and I ran out and. I mean, that's normal for me, but I mean, somebody else would be looking at me going, are you okay? Like, but, oh yeah, I know the camera's here, but I put the, problem solved. I put the program on my other monitor, um, because I like to, uh, I don't know, I like to look at the picture of me while I'm talking. I don't know. It's just a natural habit. I mean, because when you're talking to yourself, like, you have to look at something. So, I usually look at the program to make sure it's recording. I tip my glasses down every once in a while to see how long it's been, and then I just keep talking. But anyway, um, so that was that. Um, I nearly was late for work today. Well, let me rephrase that. I was late for work today, but nobody noticed, and they thanked me, 
and were so happy to see me when I got there. And nobody said a single word about the fact that I was like almost 25 minutes late. Nobody said a single word. They just saw me and they go, you are here. Thank God. And I was like, yes, I'm here. And they were like, oh, it's been a horrible day. And like, you're going to be so helpful and I'm so glad to see you and all that kind of stuff. And it was, it was a, it was a semi rough night. I mean, people around the holiday season are jerks and I'm sorry, but you are people in general in the holiday season are jerks. I, I, I don't understand how you could be so mean. You know, you have to keep in mind, when you walk into a retail store and ask a question of a sales associate, you know, that's fine. That's what they're there for. Ask them a question. But when you see, but, but keep in mind, keep in mind, but when you see them running around and it looks like they're doing something, it's not really okay to stop them. They're going to stop what they're doing and say, yeah, this is where you find that. And then they're going to keep going on their way. But it just, it baffles me. Like we, the things that you have to do at retail are ridiculous. You have to restock all the time. And, and it's not easy. No matter, I don't, I am so tired of people saying, can you go back and check your stock? Holy crap. No, I can't really. Because there's not just you. There's six other people standing up front looking around that I have to, I'm required by my supervisor to ask if they need anything. And let me tell you, they're all going to say yes. They're all going to ask me questions because I'm the associate in charge of tech. I am the guy that knows the most about the tech stuff in the store right now, and that's my job. I can't go back and check stock for a $6 item that I could just order for you, get it sent to your house for free. What's your problem? Seriously. And nine times out of ten, stock is out. If there's stock, especially at a store like Staples and especially at, at, at a place that... Um, you know, I mean, just you have to realize that if the store is only this big, you see, you see from the outside, the store looks about this big. Okay. You know, the store contains about this much of actual floor space. In this tiny little section, I'm not going to have. Because we have to have offices in the back, too. So take about that much off for offices. You have to have bathrooms. Take that much off for the bathrooms. You have to have a shipping and receiving department. You have to take that off for that. You have to have a back stock. You have to have a furniture stock because we don't have that out on the floor. You take that down. I'm not going to fit back stock for all of the items in the store in, in like a 100 by 100 foot space. And that's what we got back there. We don't have back stock in the back of Staples. There's no stock out back. Whatever stock we have is up front, or it's still on shipping pallets, which means I can't go through it, and I'm not allowed to go through it until they check it into the system anyway. What's wrong with you people? Like, seriously. Now, you got a huge store like Walmart. They got pallets and pallets of extra stock out back. Fine. Ask them if they'll check that stock out back. Nine times out of ten, if you're asking somebody to check stock out back, nine times out of ten, they're going to tell you they don't have it. Why? Because they don't have it. You know, and I hate doing that to people. I really hate. I, I, I'll I ask them. I'll be like, do you guys carry extra stock out back? And if they say no, if they say yeah, I'll be like, could you check? If they say no, I'll be like, okay, yeah. I worked at a retail store that didn't. I understand. Like, I just need to know if you carry extra stock, if there's any more stock in the store. Or you carry stock anywhere else. But, jeez, people can be rude. I had a guy stop me today and tell me how disrespectful it was to him that nobody had asked him yet if we could help him. And I said, I'm really sorry, sir. I was pulled over by a customer that had a computer issue that um, we had to fix. And I was also pulled over by somebody in ink. And I know that my manager has been dealing with uh, this gentleman and his phone signups. And I know that um, 
my associate, my assistant manager for the store, uh, is over. Um, my assistant manager for the store is um, dealing dealing with some issues over in copy and print. And the guy goes, "Well, you had a cashier the whole time, and I don't think that's fair." I was like, "You know, the cashier is required to stay there in case anybody else in the store decides they want to leave." Like, cashiers sit around a lot. It's normal. It's normal. You sit around a lot. Cashiers are hurry up and wait people. And people like them to hurry up. So complaining that they're waiting there for you to be finished is, is ridiculous. I was like, I just kind of wanted to reach out and just be like, Psh. but you know, it just, it infuriates me. It infuriates me. But you know, I'm going to be respectful of the gentleman. And so I said, I'm really sorry about that, sir. What can I do to help you? You know, I mean, it's not, it's not our problem. Like, in, in, and I'm not just talking, I'm not, and I'm not talking from an official staple standpoint. I'm talking from a human standpoint. Cut the people a break. Retail workers work their butt off. You do. And most, and this is the worst part, most people do work their butt off. You know, you get one or two that don't. And, and we recognize that. And we understand that. And we, we're sorry for that. We really are. But we are, as people, can't make other people do their jobs, you know. But if somebody's working their butt off, you know, running around. I mean, I, w I never stopped running around the store tonight until like 7 p.m. Running. Like, literally, one customer was done, I'd, dick a I'd, I'd like quick walk slash jog over to the next one and say, hey, I'm sorry for the wait. Is there anything I can do to help you? You know, but and then I had to have people like block my path and stop me and ask me questions and say, excuse me, I just need this. I'm like, excuse me, you can just wait for one minute. I would say, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm helping another customer, I need a second. And they're like, I only have one question. And I'm like, I'm really sorry, but this guy has only been here for two hours and has needs my help. Like, it's like, you can't just get your one question in without being unfair to everybody else. But nobody seems to accept that or respect that. Like, don't stop in a store if you need to ask a question. When everybody, when there's like 50 people in the store, go towards closing time, go towards 7 p.m., 8 p.m. at night, then ask as many questions as you want. The smart shoppers seem to know that because there's people that won't show up until like 30 minutes before closing time. Reason being, right about an hour before closing time, everybody pans out, you know, like 7 p.m. Most stores start to empty. So you can go at that time and ask all the questions you want. And that may be inconvenient for you, but... It's also convenient for you because then you don't have to ha listen to me tell you, I'm sorry, I can't help you right now. We're busy. But hey, who knows? I'm just me, and maybe I'm missing something here, and I'm probably wrong. You know? But I mean, it, for, as a, on the standpoint of talking people to people, I wish it was better. I wish it was just better. I wish more people had more concern and more care. And then that way, issues like the the holiday deaths and crap like that wouldn't happen you know it's like people get so desperate for stuff they don't really need i would never rush anybody at best buy staples or anything any i've never rushed anybody at a convenience store because i've i've always said to myself like oh why am i rushing them i really don't need this like yeah i want a router if i don't get a router within the next 10 minutes it's not going to kill me. If I'm a little late to something because I had to wait for somebody at a store, it's not going to kill me. If I'm stopping at work on the way to a store, it's not going to kill me. If I really have an issue, I'll call the store ahead of time and say, hey, I'm looking for this. Do you have it? Do you not? And I'll ask my question over the phone. I don't mind those people at all. I had somebody call me and say, hey, I'm in a rush and I just wanted to check before I got to the store. Do you have this? I checked, and sure enough, we had it, so I pulled it aside for the gentleman. He walked in. I said, oh, yeah, I got that right here. He walked out. That's what you do if you need to go to a store and you're in a rush. You don't get to the store and then start asking a billion questions. You do your own research and then answer your own yeah, questions. I mean, I, I'm here to answer questions, but, like, not if you're in a rush. Like, if you're in a rush, like, why, you know? But regardless, you know, just it's stressful, very stressful, very stressful. And 
I, I don't understand how people can be so mean to people that are there just to help them. Like, my job is just to help you guys and make sure you guys are taken care of and make sure that everybody gets what they need. That's my job. And I will do my job and I will make sure you get what you need. And I will help you the best I can. But at the same time, like, offer some decency and respect to people. Like, I'm still a person too. Like, I know you're, you, it, I, I would love to see you come do this job and then walk away with the same view you have right now because you won't you won't nobody ever walks away from a retail job like that I didn't ever understood my parents saying they worked retail like that's a phrase and that means like you know what it's like if you've never worked retail in your life and then there's people that do the jerk thing and say I've worked retail I know well if you worked retail, why are you being so mean about it? Like, you know what it's like to be here. And then there's people that start to complain and stuff, and then they go, excuse me, I'm sorry, I've worked retail, I'm just in a rush. Don't mind those people at all. Don't mind them at all. They're like, you know, I, I forget sometimes it's been so long, like I forget. But I understand that you're busy, that's fine, I've worked retail, it's okay. You know, I love those people. And I like the people that do that for waitresses and stuff, like... Those people have like 12 tables to manage just because they get something wrong. No problem, you know. Just gotta be more understanding nowadays. Just be nice to people. It's like I don't understand all the rudeness and all the me, 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 me. Get over yourself. Seriously. You're one person. You're one person in a world full of billions of people. You matter. But you don't matter any more than the next person. We all matter. We all matter equally, and we all matter very importantly. Not a single person's unimportant, you know? But some people don't see that. I mean, it's just me. So for the last couple things I will say today, mm, actually, I think I'm good. I think I'm good for today. I think that's about everything. Oh, I'll do a random Hemingway read for jokes and giggles and wiggles and any anybody interested in buying a PCIe sound card. I don't have any use for it. It's not the one I want. So um, I gotta I gotta I have a I have this obnoxious Christmas and holiday and gift wish list that uh. The cheapest thing on it is like thirty-five dollars, and that's and that's the cheapest thing. And the next cheapest thing is like a hundred dollars. It's sad. I really, I really want this this thing called a Banana Pie router. I think it's like a BPI R1. And what it is is it's an open source router, and it would allow me to like put my own custom routing software on it, and then I could like actually hook up my home network the way I want to. Which would be so amazing, because what I'd do is I'd I'd, I'd run from the the Wi-Fi box that I have straight to this router, and then I'd run everything in my apartment off this router. I wouldn't run anything else, and it would be literally just a gigantic um uh antenna that would accept the Wi-Fi signal from up at the house, and it would it would just be awesome. That's all I can say. It would just be awesome. There's no other word, but it'd be awesome. And it'd be awesome. Oh, see that? That's annoying. That's a pimple. That's it. Combo. Annoying blemish on skin. They get... They 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 happen right where my glasses touch at the tops and bottoms. And sometimes right here in the middle. There's one starting right here, but I keep rubbing it out. And it goes away. But they, they're annoying. Anyway. Um, I have a long list somewhere. But, oh my gosh some great stuff on there. A graphics card I've wanted that's about like 300 bucks and um, uh, a, a speaker I want that's like 130. It's a, it's a base, um, a Bose base uh, powered amplifier. So um, I have some decent bass in my house, but like when you get towards the really low end, I fixed some of it. Um, I bought a little Bose box that just does low end, and I and it fixes it a little bit. But I mean, the speakers on the sides are so high powered with treble that, you know, 
I don't have a separate bass that I can adjust because I like I like my movies and my bass to sound boom, but um, it's hard to get to. Anyway, it's a really cool list, but um, holidays are coming up and I have to buy presents and I got to figure out how I'm giving all my presents out because I'm so busy all the time, you know. For family, it's not going to be that hard, but for people I don't talk to and I never see, it's going to be like, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to give you a present? Like, seriously, how? How am I going to ever run into you to give you a present? Or, or even worse, how am I going to give you a present? Like, we don't talk much, I don't remember where you live, like, I don't really chat on the phone with you too much either, like, how do I give you a present? Because, eh. I mean, I'm that type of guy that, for certain people, I give them presents anyway. So, I mean, I have, I have a list of about six people I want to give presents to. Three of them are family. Two of them are friends. Well, three, three of them are friends. Um, just, but, one of them, I don't really talk to at all, but, I mean, it's somebody, it's like, it's a friend of mine, it's just, we don't talk that much, like, I don't know how to explain it, but, another one is, um, an ex-girlfriend of mine, um, best friend for, like, two years, like, awesome person, and, I mean, I just, I want to get her a gift just to be nice, you know, because she's also my boss, like, I just want to be nice, and then, the other, the other person I want to give a gift to is um, a, a person I text occasionally, and I don't know how to give that person a gift either, because it's like, we text occasionally, but like, I know where you, and, and the weird thing is, it's like, I know where they live, and they're like, I, I've been to their houses before, but it's just kind of awkward to just show up and be like, oh, here's a Christmas gift, you know, it's me, I haven't seen you in a little while, like, eh. I mean, it's just, and it, the only reason is because those are the three people I've, like, last talked to. Like, seriously talked to, and I don't just mean acquaintance talked, because I do that all the time. But, I mean, seriously had an in-depth, deep discussion about my life with that person. Doesn't happen a lot. Anyway, that would be it for this video. Oh, wait, I said I was going to do some anyway. Um, we're going to go with that page. I think we're in a farewell to arms. Yes, we are. We are in a farewell to arms. Oh wow! Right on the page I wanted. This doesn't really talk about much interesting. Actually, you know what I want to just read? A little bit from the beginning of The Old Man in the Sea. The reason being is because I like the relationship that he sets up with um, this, this younger kid. So this is the beginning of uh, The Old Man in the Sea. I'll probably read like maybe a page or so to give you a collection of this, but this is a good one. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. In the first 40 days, a boy had been with him. But after 40 days without a fish, the boy's parents had told him that the old man was now definitely and finally Salayo, which is the worst form of unlucky. The boy had gone at their orders in another boat, which caught three good fish the first week. It made the boy sad to see the old man come in each day, with his skiff empty, and he always went down to help him carry either the coiled lines or the gaff and the harpoon in the sail that was furled around the mast. The sail was patched with four with flour sacks and furled. It looked like a flag of permanent defeat. The old man was thin and gaunt with deep wrinkles in, a, in the back of his neck. The brown splotches of benevolent skin cancer the sun brings from its reflection on the tropic sea were on his cheeks. The blotches ran well down the sides of his face and his hands had the deep crease scars from handling heavy fish on the cords, but none of these scars were fresh. They were as old as erosions in a fishless desert. 
Everything about him was old except his eyes. They were the same color as the sea and were cheerful and undefeated. Santiago, said the boy, as they climbed the bank from where the skiff was hauled up. I could go with you again. We've made some money. The old man had taught the boy to fish and the boy loved him. No, the old man said. You're with a lucky boat. Stay with them. But remember how you went 87 days without fish and then we caught big ones every day for three weeks? I remember, the old man said. I know you did not leave me because you doubted. It was Papa that made me leave. I am a boy and I must obey him. I know, the old man said. It's quite normal. He hasn't much faith. No, the old man said. But we have, haven't we? Yes, the boy said. Can I offer you a beer on the terrace and then we'll take the stuff home? Why not? Between Fishermen They sat on the terrace and many of the fishermen made fun of the old man, and he was not angry. Others of the old fishermen looked at him and were sad, but they did not show it, and they spoke politely about the current and the depths they had drifted their lines at and the steady good weather and what they had seen. The successful fishermen of that day were already in and had butchered their marlin out and carried them laid full across the length of two planks, with two men staggering at the end of each plank to the fish house where they waited for the ice trucks to carry them to the market in Havana. Those who had caught the sharks had taken them to the shark factory on the other side of the cove where they were hoisted on block and tackled, their livers removed, their fins cut off, their hides skinned out, and their flesh cut into strips for salting. When the wind was in the east. A smell came across the harbor from the shark factory, but today there was only the faint edge of the odor because the wind had backed into the north and then dropped off. It was pleasant and sunny on the terrace. So it's classic old, old uh, learned man and a younger faithful boy. And this this book is brilliant because it it's just it talks about the old man and his depth of knowledge of life and the fact that although he doesn't get much he still doesn't see his life as a waste and he doesn't become sad and he doesn't become angry whereas the kid has a lot more potential and talent and he has a lot more going for him the kid still respects the old man's wisdom and knows the old man has the true knowledge of the sea, not just the the luck that other people have. Anyway, another good book. Not as good as The Sun Also Rises, but another good book. Alright, that would be it for today. Um, mm, headed off to watch a movie and text myself. It sounds kind of weird. What I meant to say was I'm off to watch a movie and I'll be up for a while. So if anybody needs me, go ahead and get at me. All right. Good night, anyone. Everyone. Anyone. <laughs> good night, anyone. I'm not talking to myself. I'm kidding. Good night.